American foreign policy should be about the security of the United States, first and foremost, that we've been waging too many wars abroad, getting in a lot of entanglements, making a lot of commitments that don't make us safer. And so we need to be resetting American foreign policy. And our theory of change is very much like your own. Uh, It's based on talent. It's based on people. We're trying to build a community of people who broadly share our ideas. You know, we're very big tent in our approach and then have those people working together, talking to each other, getting to know each other, getting to trust one another so that they can actually deliver change and counteract the baseline tendency in Washington, which is to have a lot of foreign policy because it's a company town. Foreign policy is one of the industries here. If you work in the foreign policy industry, you benefit from America having a lot of foreign policy. It gives you more power, more attention, et cetera. But that doesn't mean it's what's best for the public interest. And so that's what we're trying to bring back into the conversation. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Nick Solheim. I'm the COO of American Moment. Uh, And today I was joined by a a great guest, uh, John Allen Gay, who is the executive director of the John Quincy Adams Society. We talked about all things Iran and Middle East related. Um, We talked about the Gaza Pier. And then in the the bonus section, um, we got to his famous uncle and playing chess if that's if that's really what like diplomacy and war is like uh it's a super fascinating episode uh to access that bonus episode as a reminder um we do have a membership program on youtube if you would like to see my new fits and whatever crazy colored jacket sarab is wearing uh you can watch this show on youtube for free uh but if you would like to get access to some of that bonus content and the episode a day early. You can become a truther or a statesman on YouTube uh, and get access to all of that extra content, which is really a lot of fun. I've been wanting to ask like some of these fun questions for a while about people who have private obsessions and and we're super glad uh, to have a venue to do that. Before I introduce John, a um, couple things to flag for you on our website, uh, which, by the way, you can visit at AmericanMoment.org. We currently have our fellowship application for the fall, our first ever fall fellowship for American statecraft class. That is live on our website right now. Go apply for it. It's AmericanMoment.org slash fellowship. It's not hard. Type it in your browser. Go apply. Come get paid $3,000 a month to get your start uh, uh, in your career here in D.C. We have a lot of fun. We start with a, a super cool retreat so we can all get to know each other. Um, and and it's like over 60 units of content over the summer and then bespoke help in getting your first job by the end of the program. So uh, please go ahead and check that out. Um, And then if you're going to be an intern here over the summer, uh, we have our Foundations of American Statecraft program and AM Fridays as well, which is uh, free educational programming uh, that we do with some of our best speakers and many guests of this podcast. Uh, So you can check out that you can check that out at AmericanMoment.org slash foundations and AmericanMoment.org slash AM Fridays. So that's kind of all the programming stuff we have going on. Uh, it's it's always a crazy madhouse around here. Um, but if you're a longtime listener of the show, we would really love to have you in that programming if you're not already. So John Allen Gay uh, is a, a repeat guest. We had him very early on. I think it was like the first 10 maybe 20 episodes uh, uh, to talk about um, the John Quincy Adams Society, realism and restraint, etc. We had him back on today to specifically focus in on everything going on in the Middle East, whether it's uh, Israel's war with Hamas or how we uh, develop an off-ramp with uh, what seems to be an increasing call for conflict with Iran. Uh, it was a fantastic episode. I learned a, a, a lot of a lot of new things, and I'm now terrified about uh, this building, this pier in Gaza, which uh, President Biden referenced in his State of the Union. Uh, we 
we dove super deep into that issue in particular. Um, so John is the executive director of the John Quincy Adams Society, a national network of student groups centered on a vision of foreign policy restraint. He is a former managing editor of the National Interest, uh, which is a fantastic publication, uh, where his writing focused on U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. He is also a, a co-author with Jeffrey Kemp of War with Iran, Political, Military, and Economic Consequences. He holds a master's degree in international relations from Syracuse University's Maxwell School and a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the College of William and Mary. See, a bachelor's in philosophy is not the most useless degree you can have. Uh, you can you can get a degree in philosophy and still and still get a job uh, in Washington and be quite prominent uh, like like John is. Um, it was a really fantastic episode today. I uh, hope you'll have the chance to listen to it uh, straight through. I, I, I guarantee that you'll learn a lot. We will go now to John Allen Gay. John, thanks for coming on the podcast. Nick, thanks for having me. It's always great to be on here. You know, I obviously I always tell people to get involved in the John Quincy Adams Society, but if they're on the right, I always tell them to get involved with American Moment. You guys are doing so many amazing things, and I'm a huge fan of the work that you guys are doing. Well, we uh, really appreciate that. And if we could plug anything for you guys, the uh, the newsletter, the jobs, internships, and it is it is the we've said this on the show I think a couple times, but if you're looking for a role in foreign policy in D.C., uh, the John Quincy Adams Society newsletter is the place to go. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and, and get started here. Uh, you've been on this show before, so we don't need to go too long on the introduction, but, uh, for, for people who may not have been around when you first came on the show, um, who are you <laughs> and how, how did you get where you are today? Yeah. So I'm the former managing editor of National Interest Magazine, which is a uh, storied uh, foreign policy publication here in the, the Washington world associated with the school of realism in foreign policy, you know, that we should have our foreign policy be set first and foremost by the world as it is, not as the world as we would like it to be. So it's a it's it's a bit of an anti-idealist disposition, which I think is a, uh, a, a, di a disposition that foreign policy rewards because the international system is pretty ugly. And if you bet on power and cynicism prevailing nine times out of 10, you're probably going to make good predictions most of the time. So that's that's where I come from uh, intellectually. And then for the last eight years or so, I've been the executive director of the John Quincy Adams Society, named for our uh, Secretary of State and President John Quincy Adams, famous for the phrase, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She's the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She's the champion and vindicator only of her own. And I think that's our ethos for foreign policy. We're saying, hey... American foreign policy should be about the security of the United States, first and foremost, that we've been waging too many wars abroad, getting in a lot of entanglements, making a lot of commitments that don't make us safer. And so we need to be resetting American foreign policy. And our theory of change is very much like your own. Uh, it's based on talent. It's based on people. We are trying to build a community of people who broadly share our ideas. You know, we're very big tent in our approach and then have those people working together, talking to each other, getting to know each other, getting to trust one another so that they can actually deliver change and counteract the baseline tendency in Washington, which is to have a lot of foreign policy because it's a company town. Foreign policy is one of the industries here. If you work in the foreign policy industry, you benefit from America having a lot of foreign policy. It gives you more power, more attention, et cetera. But that doesn't mean it's what's best for the public interest. And so that's what we're trying to bring back into the conversation. Yeah, that's uh, great. And I, I do have to say we've gotten a lot of um, fellowship applicants from, <laughs> from your newsletter and people that uh, cite uh, John Quincy Adams Society as a huge um, influence on their foreign policy worldview. Uh, we've had people go through our programming that have gone through your programming. And so uh, we are we are definitely benefiting each other <laughs> in, the, in that way. Um, you're really well known, at least in our circles, for uh, being a, an expert um, 
on the Middle East uh, broadly, but specifically on Iran. You've you've written a book about this um, for people that listen to our show that are looking to get into foreign policy. Um, how did you become an expert on Iran specifically, and and more broadly, how how do you kind of decide like which area to focus on? like policy wise? Yes. The latter is often an easier question. If you want to work in U.S. national security, you want to look at countries that are of U.S. national security concern and are likely to continue to be places of national security concern. So some of it, some of my own journey uh, in this is a bit contingent and I'll go into that. But Some of it is also looking at the map of the world and saying, "Okay, we've got certain problems in certain regions uh, and how can I fit in in a way that makes sense for a career? And the thing about the Middle East is America has a pretty steady history of involvement there in my lifetime. And uh, it's not a region that you could say the lion is going to lay down with the lamb anytime soon. And so there will probably be an ongoing need for U.S. national security expertise on the Middle East in the long term. Uh, And you could say that with more certainty than a place like even, say, Korea or when I was in there, the one of the critical languages they were looking for was Serbo-Croatian. And I said, okay, you know, I'm not sure the Balkans are going to be a central priority for the United States uh, forever. And I feel like I feel pretty vindicated in that. (laughs) So. That was part of the step. And you can find things like the list of critical needs languages uh, for the U.S. government where they're really trying to hire people who speak these things. And then you just want to focus on one country or one aspect of a region. There's also like subject matters you can get into, like you can become a nuclear weapons expert or a biological weapons expert. Uh, So you can build from there and just try to stay disciplined in your pursuit of that. So in my case... I initially was when I very first came into Washington was in grad school. I was much more focused on Saudi Arabia. Uh, My dad had deployed there in the 90s. So I I had always had an interest in it. Uh, And I think unlike a lot of people in Washington, I'm I'm just very fascinated by that country. I don't necessarily have like the visceral disgust that a lot of people in Washington have with Saudi Arabia. But. As I got involved in projects in D.C. around, you know, 2011, 2012, there was a lot of talk that we were going to end up in a conflict with Iran over their nuclear program. And so I ended up needing to learn a whole lot about Iran and said, OK, I'm already this far in. I'll keep going. And so I started taking, you know, Persian classes at night and really trying to learn all that I could about Iran, get to understand it better. and. That, you know, very quickly let me get to a a higher level of knowledge than the average person. And I've just made that part of my portfolio ever since. Yeah. Well, let's um talk about the Middle East. Let's talk about Iran. Um, there are, like you've said, you know, the United States has, has been uh, highly involved in the Middle East uh, over the last, I want to say a few decades, but it's 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 uh, in some cases it's been longer than that. Um how can we, as you know, people who work in in policy, many of the staffers listen to this show, uh, be thinking about how to facilitate a balance of power in the Middle East that uh, promotes stability with minimal involvement um, from the United States, whether that's cash or troops. For starters, we need to make that our goal: a right. balance of power that promotes stability with minimal involvement from the United States in cash and troops. Like that is not the goal for most of Washington. Yeah. They are trying to have a preponderance of power to be managing the region and maybe grudgingly recognizing, okay, it's not as big a deal as it used to be. You don't get as many stars on your resume if you know Arabic, etc. Uh, everybody's starting to focus on China, but even then we're going to compete with China over the Middle East and and every other part of this planet. Uh, we need to have a mindset shift, which is is basically that in terms of like what we need and, you know, like what impacts Joe Schmo from Idaho from the Middle East is a relatively stable flow of oil out of the region. You know, whatever you think of oil, it's still a critical economic input, still is going to be for the foreseeable future affects stuff downstream like grocery prices, gas prices, of course. 
Uh, and therefore, it is something that impacts ordinary Americans so that we need some level of stability in the Middle East for the United States. How that looks, frankly, I, I think uh, one is recognizing that nobody is on the brink of taking over the Middle East. If you look at the demographics of the region, the populations of the countries, the sizes of their economies, there's not one player that's obviously positioned to dominate it. And some of the larger countries also have a lot of internal problems that are going to consume a lot of their resources and make it harder for them to launch some bid for regional hegemony, regional dominance, you know, making uh, making themselves the new sultans uh, of the region. And so recognizing that, I think we want to preserve that sense of balance while also not getting, you know, say terrorist attacks coming from the region. And I think that the Trump administration was wise to pursue a framework that counters the influence of of Iran around the region because they are the power that's most inclined to challenge us, that's most inclined to destabilize the region, uh, that's that least fits in with its neighbors. Uh, and, and the way they did that was this Abraham Accords framework, which was basically bringing together the countries in the region that most fear Iran and that are most willing to stand up to it and counterbalance it, making their relationships smoother. Because the thing is, uh, one group of those countries is the conservative monarchies of the Persian Gulf, countries like Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates. The other group of those countries uh, is it's basically Israel. Uh, and needless to say, uh, for those of you who don't watch the news, Arab-Israeli relations are a little bit complicated. And so the United States is a crucial strategic partner to both of those sets of countries. And that means when we come in and sit in the middle, it helps them sit down with each other. And so that Abraham Accords framework was taking some of the covert cooperation that these countries already had based on their shared interests and common enemies and making it more overt, which I think in the long term is going to enable it to be deeper, you know, for them to be openly associating with each other, for some of these Gulf countries to stop uh, putting nasty anti-Semitic stuff in the textbooks that they give their children, et cetera, to not have as much propaganda against Israel, et cetera. That will make it politically easier for them to have a more robust relationship with the Israelis that then doesn't necessarily require the United States to be sitting in the middle, giving them permission to sit down with one another. And I think the leadership of the Gulf countries was pretty brave to take those kind of steps. I mean, for the Israelis, it's it's easy for them to say yes, uh, but it's these were unpopular moves in some of these countries or ones where the public was willing to humor their leaders. And so the Trump administration setting that up was a very wise course of action. I think there was a division within that administration and in Washington generally about whether the Abraham Accords are a framework for America to recommit to the Middle East and be more involved in, and stay at the center of this relationship or to decommit from the Middle East, to reduce our role and let these uh, these new regional partners do more of the counterbalancing of Iran. I would very much put myself in the latter camp because I don't think – uh, between the legacy of the last 20, 30 years and the rise of China, that America should be doing more in the Middle East or even aspiring to do roughly what we do currently. We're in a very exposed position around the region. So that was the, that was how they were doing it. I think we should be expanding that, doubling down on it, really trying to build the muscle memory of those partnerships so that they can do the standing up themselves. What do you think a uh, a phase two of the Abraham Accords in a realist administration would look like? Like, where do you go from here? I think you well, right now you need to get past the post October 7th conflict, which by the time uh, by the time we have a realist administration, uh, which could be as soon as eight months, I guess, uh, 
that might be winding down. It would certainly, I hope, be in a new phase. I think that would create a little more bandwidth. Now, the Biden administration's approach to this has been to try to bring Saudi Arabia in on terms that are very unfavorable to the United States. Basically, the Saudis are are looking at this situation and saying, you know what, we want to get the best deal possible for us from America. So what we want is a nuclear enrichment program, which is basically what Iran has. And the uh, the Saudis have said for years, we're going to get whatever Iran gets. So if Iran chooses to turn its nuclear program into a nuclear weapon, they have very strongly implied we're going to get a nuclear weapon ourselves. And traditionally, U.S. foreign policy has not tried to encourage new countries to acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, and I certainly think Saudi Arabia is not at the top of my list of countries I wouldn't worry about if they had yeah. <laughs> nuclear weapons floating around. I mean, this is a country that produced 15 of the 19 9-11 hijackers, Osama bin Laden. Uh, its political system is less stable than it looks in certain ways. Uh, I mean, the current leader, MBS, more or less rose in a palace coup. It's not the kind of situation where you want uh, nuclear weapons floating around. So they want us to pretty much give them a pathway to that. And they've, they've, the administration is trying to paint a veneer over that, but that's realistically what's going to happen. They also want a U.S. defense guarantee, a, def- a formal alliance with the United States. And there's been all kinds of rumors about that, how this will look. Anything from uh, we'll consult with them if there's an attack on Saudi Arabia to we will defend them if there's an attack on Saudi Arabia. And I think realistically, once you make those kinds of commitments, whatever the paper form of it is, that commitment tends to grow into a more formal commitment. I mean, even even the NATO alliance, if you actually read the text of Article 5, which is the the operative part of the treaty, it doesn't explicitly say you're immediately going to go to war uh, and send your own military in. You have a little bit more flexibility than that. But the way it's interpreted in Washington these days, 75 years after the start of the treaty, is that the United States is there fighting from day one. Yeah. And so I don't want us to make that commitment because I think it's going to expand. And again, we need to be decentering ourselves in the region, not recentering ourselves in the region. So they've basically been trying to give the Saudis the store. Uh, in return for recognizing Israel, which is something that's in Saudi Arabia's interest. They already have a covert relationship with the Israelis. It's an open secret. So I think a realist administration should be pursuing that, but in a way that aligns with America's interests, not with Saudi Arabia's interests. And that, I think, has to include a willingness to walk away from the table if those are the terms that they're setting. And my hope is that if you set different terms, if you say, yeah, we're not going to give you that that you could then have a conversation about whether you can get something for something that's good for them, good for us, good for the Israelis, et cetera. Yeah. W- one thing that's interesting uh, about the John Quincy Adams Society is that you guys are sort of a, uh, I don't know if you would use the word bipartisan or transpartisan or whatever uh, organization. I've met with uh, some people on the left that have gone through your programming, uh, great folks that are very aligned with us on foreign policy. But uh, one of the one of the things that I saw after um, President Biden authorized the withdrawal from Afghanistan was a lot of people saying, we have our realist <laughs> administration. We have our our uh, realist uh, president right here. He's finally pulling out of this uh, out of this war uh, in the Middle East. And I think everything that we've seen from um, Israel and Palestine to Ukraine, et cetera, um, uh, kind of makes it pretty clear that that's not true. Um, how do you, how do you think about, um, realism on the left? Like who, who's kind of the lodestar of that movement that's actually in, in power that you can tell people on the left to look up to, um, or is Joe Biden a realist? Yeah. I mean, we say realism and restraint, and I think the restraint part of our foreign policy appeals more to like the kind of public progressive audience 
uh, where it's basically saying, yeah, like America should be involved in fewer wars. They tend they tend to agree with that Mm -hmm. uh, and they tend to agree with it for different reasons. And that's what I think is interesting and challenging about working in a transpartisan context is recognizing like people can have similar goals for very different reasons and you can sit and argue about those reasons all day and you know call each other nasty names on twitter or you can work toward those shared goals and be like yeah let's sort those other you know deeper philosophical problems out at our victory party like i'm i'm a political realist so i'm interested in results in the real world i want to win uh i don't want to win philosophically so I think uh, there are definitely some some folks out there that people can look up to. Uh, I tend to be a fan of uh, Representative Rokana out in California. I, I think his way of engaging in politics is very interesting generally. I mean, he sat down uh, a few weeks ago with Bishop Robert Barron, uh, you know, kind of a prominent theologically conservative Catholic uh, cleric. Both of these are also very thoughtful guys, and they had a they had a really interesting conversation that I still don't know what to make of it, uh, but it shows that he's willing to reach out to to people all across the spectrum. But he's pretty solid on foreign policy. I would also point to to Bernie Sanders. You know, he's somebody who has been pretty consistently willing to buck the status quo on uh, on in from the kind of Democratic establishment. Sometimes Elizabeth Warren can be very interesting. She's very well advised, has very sharp people in her office who kind of know where the bodies are buried and things like the defense budget, uh, where government or defense companies are trying to uh, get one over on the taxpayer in ways that don't uh, don't actually lead to us having uh, a better, more effective military, but lead to a better bottom line for some of these big companies out there. So, like, those are places that I would definitely encourage people to look if you're young and on the left or if you're just trying to understand uh, some good perspectives from folks on that side of the aisle. Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, Biden's State of the Union. Uh, we were talking about this right before we started recording that one of the interesting things that nobody I don't want to say nobody, but a lot of people didn't pick up on uh, was um, President Biden's uh, part of the speech where he was talking about uh, the Gaza Pier. Uh, so tell us about that. What is it and and what does it mean uh, for the uh, conflict in Israel as well as the Middle East more broadly? Yeah, the uh, the perilous pier or Haram <laughs> Harbor, uh, as I like to call it. <laughs> Yeah. So this was it was kind of a throwaway line in Biden's speech. And the cynic in me sees it as uh, already a successful operation in the sense that Biden had something to talk about in his State of the Union speech that lets him triangulate between the uh, the folks in his coalition that are more sympathetic to Israel, the folks in his coalition that are more sympathetic to Palestine, the folks in his coalition that like Israel, but are also like really uh, torn up about the conflict. So it let him say, hey, we're supporting Israel. And also we're going to be providing aid through this unique channel. Uh, and it's I would encourage folks to go online and look up the uh, the joint publication on the, what the actual operation is. It's a type of thing the military can do called joint logistics over the shore. If you read it, it's super complicated. And what they are trying to do is say pretty much there's going to be a bright line either on the beach or somewhere offshore where American soldiers are not going to be crossing over that. We won't be putting boots on the ground in Gaza Uh, We might or might not be putting boots on the pier that's going to stick out like 1,200 feet off the coast of Gaza, uh, which Gaza is a small place. So it's going to be really close to a lot of a lot of pretty nasty stuff that's going on there. Um, There's going to be all kinds of dangers. They're going to be trying to deliver aid from ships in Cyprus. They're going to come to this floating offshore island pier thing that then is going to load it onto smaller ships and take it to the pier. And then supposedly there's going to be some contractor, which will probably be staffed with Americans, uh, taking stuff off of those smaller ships down the pier uh, and then assembling it somewhere in Gaza, stuff like food aid, aid and all that. And what's interesting about this is like it's basically putting the camel's nose inside the tent So even if it uh, stays exactly where it is, it's very risky. Like even if the operation goes off exactly as planned, you're going to be within rocket and possibly even mortar range of uh, of Hamas. I mean, Hamas is capable 
at least at the beginning of the conflict, of striking deep into Israel. I mean, they were shooting rockets at fairly far away places like Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. So they could certainly take aim at something that's right off their shore. And if they're in this like existential death struggle with the Israelis, which it sure looks like they're in a very desperate position right now, turning it into a fight against not just Israel, but America has a certain political logic uh, for them. And so I think it's very concerning that we're going to have troops in this position. Uh, And you look at these manuals on how the operation is done. I think there's going to be a lot of pressure from the commanders on the scene saying, hey, we could do this better if we do it ourselves. Uh, you know, there's a lot of coordination problems. It's it's a really complicated type of operation. We know how to do it. Our partners, whether it's this contractor or the Israelis or some, you know, local Palestinian force, we're going to do it better than they can because they don't spend all day training to do it. They don't have specialized military <clears throat> units that do this. And so let us send one guy on the shore. Oh, and that guy needs five guys to protect him. And then, you know, we need to send another guy onto the shore to build a place for them to sit. And then, you know, it's, it's going to just keep snowballing and snowballing. I mean, I, I think a lot about the Black Hawk Down incident in Somalia, uh, where a lot of U.S. soldiers were killed in this big fight uh, that started because we had been trying to ensure the delivery of aid uh, and then turned into let's help capture some of the leaders of the people that are stopping us from delivering aid. And it turned into a military disaster and led to Americans losing their lives in a conflict that did not have a lot to do with the interests of the United States, the security of the United States. I'm really worried that it's going to go that direction because I think the operational logic is going to be pushing that way. And there's all these complexities the closer you look at it. like So once that aid gets on shore, you know, do the trucks uh, that come in to carry it away, uh, you have to take those through security because they're just going out into Gaza somewhere and someone could put a bomb on them. And if it's going through IDF checkpoints, possibly American uh, military checkpoints or American contractor checkpoints, I bet they'd love to put a bomb on one of those trucks and they have the power to coerce people because they're an armed group. So I think it's really concerning. I think that there's going to be a lot of potential for us to get deeper and deeper in. And I think there is no U.S. interest in this. It's a it's a purely symbolic gesture that's being made with the lives of U.S. troops. That is, I'm very depressed by, <laughs> by all of that. Now, uh, I'm very very glad to have your uh, your insight on that. Uh, as as we think about you know this kind of, I don't know if it's right to call it like a re engagement in the Middle East, but it's certainly a, a very hot topic right now. How do we um, kind of balance thinking about some of our strategic interests there um, versus this sort of pivot to Asia moment uh, that kind of started with the election of President Trump? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, people have been talking about the pivot to Asia for for much longer and it keeps not happening. I mean, there were people in the the Bush administration who were saying, wow, you know, Asia is the future. And then they got distracted. Uh, and then the the Obama administration, you know, Hillary Clinton had a big article in Foreign Policy magazine calling for this. And then they had to reframe it as the rebalance to Asia because they didn't want people other where, uh, elsewhere in the world to feel like they were less important to the United States, which already shows the real challenge, which is that Washington hates making priorities. And this is an exercise in prioritization. Uh, you know, it, it says something about the culture of foreign policy in Washington, that there is a school of thought called prioritizers, you know, folks like Bridge Colby and stuff like that. The idea that you can't do everything is a position that requires a label <laughs> like that. That shows how far off base our conversation has gotten. And so it it's pretty clear that East Asia is where we face the biggest challenge. China is a huge rising power. And even though their system of government has a whole lot of drawbacks and they've got a lot of internal problems that distract them, that doesn't mean that they aren't also still huge. You know, if you have 1.6 billion plus people and you have a lot of problems, you're still pretty powerful or you still could be pretty powerful. And so we definitely need to be concerned, more concerned about East Asia 
than the Middle East, which, as I said earlier, does not have one country clearly positioned to take over the region and more concerned than we are about Europe because Russia uh, has shown itself to be aggressive but limited in what it's capable of. And so I think in the Middle East and Europe, we want to be reducing our exposure to those conflicts uh, or potential conflicts, decentering our role in those regions and becoming much more of a backstop or a balancer of last resort. The folks who come in when uh, when things are really getting desperate, not the folks who are there at the very first moment and who are there before the first moment. So we need to be shifting that posture, recentering our priorities in Asia. Now, the, the big wrinkles come in with like, OK, how do you get from A to B? How do you get from the United States is heavily involved in Europe and the Middle East to the United States is minimally involved without having some of these big conflicts break out that you're concerned about. And I think that requires building frameworks for a transition. And in the Middle East, that's looked like something like the Abraham Accords, building frameworks in which local powers are able to take on more of the burden. And I think from a technical standpoint, you would also want to talk about not defense treaties like the Biden administration has been doing, but defense agreements that enable us to flow forces in when there is some kind of extreme crisis. So we are acting uh, responsive to big events in the region and flowing in in reaction to them as opposed to just being there every single day, being at the center of the region's politics and having an opinion on every little development. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I think one of the biggest critiques that that view gets from neoliberals and neoconservatives is, um, oh, well, if we um, do some sort of disengagement from the Middle East, um, then all of these other, you know, powers and and actors are going to rush in we're talking about this a little bit before the show but like the russians the chinese they're going to be more involved uh what's your response to that critique i think to some extent we should say okay like what good has it done us to be super involved in in the middle east you know if, if the russians were the ones trying to manage iraq like good 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 luck to them <laughs> uh honestly like my my big anxiety in this is is not that they'll try to be there to some extent, but that they could actually be a little bit better at us because like the Chinese do not bring all the ideological baggage with them that we do. You know, they do not typically seek the political transformation of whatever country that they're in. They're not issuing human rights reports. They're not constantly criticizing the the partner government. They're typically there to make money and do whatever it is that they want to do. And they're narrowly focused. And so we come in and we're a more complicated partner to deal with. Uh, that said, the Chinese also have a reputation for being very uh, high handed and arrogant in the way that they deal with a lot of these countries. And frankly, uh, quite racist, especially when you talk about their engagement in Africa. So they have constraints of their own. Uh, and, and I think we just need to sit back and say, all right, like one, what is it that we're worried about specifically? Because if they're going to invest there, it really depends on what the investment is. Is is it going to give them strategic leverage? Is it going to give them strategic leverage in a place that we actually care about and should care about, or a place where it's just like, great, you know, they're they're the king of that of that dunghill. Uh, that doesn't really doesn't really give them anything. And then second, uh, what are our options to counter it if we decide we need to? Because the thing is that the Chinese are already getting a ton of oil from the Middle East, oil, I, I think gas as well. Uh, a lot of that oil is going over the ocean, which we can choose to just make sure that that still is deniable by the United States Navy. If you have a large number of attack submarines, a pretty capable uh, battle fleet, you're going to have the ability to stop the seaborne trade of oil. And if you're really desperate, I mean, this is all stuff like if we're in a war with China, you could also go and start wrecking some of the oil infrastructure in these places that would have real costs for us. It would not be uh, the nicest gesture uh, or a a particularly proud moment in our history, 
but it is an option that we would have uh, if we feel that they're getting too much benefit from the region and uh, we're in a situation like a war with them. Yeah. So coming back to um, Iran specifically, what is a meaningful de-escalation look like for our sort of, I don't know if you'd call it a cold war or what you'd, what you'd call it uh, with them, but what are what are some off ramps that we can kind of pursue to sort of take this off our plate? It's really challenging to figure out what that looks like because all of the frameworks and understandings that we've had with them are falling apart or have fallen apart. And the government that they have in charge right now within the regime is not one that seeks its fortunes in building ties with the West. The previous government had that as part of their theory, and there have been several governments that think that way. But these guys are very focused on Russia, on China, and on their immediate neighborhood. So they're not really looking to make some big deal with us. Uh, we could certainly try to offer something. And I, I think one of the promises uh, of uh, of Trump is his willingness to break with orthodoxy, to do stuff like go and sit down with Kim Jong-un uh, and really challenge some of the, the settled fixities of American foreign policy. But these are still really deep, longstanding, complicated problems. And I think Iran is, is a much more difficult nut to crack uh, than North Korea is, which is a fairly focused set of, of, of problems. There's not North Korean influence uh, to anything like the same scale around East Asia as there is Iranian influence in the Middle East. So I think we might want to look more at what we can do. And I think that starts with making our position in the Middle East less overextended and vulnerable. I don't think we need to be in Syria uh, we've got officially about 900 troops there right now. Some of them are in very remote, exposed positions where they're easy for Iranian militias uh, or Iranian linked militias uh, advised by Iranian uh, military leaders uh, to come and conduct attacks on U.S. forces. If we were in a much more fortified, uh, drawn down position where we're in the places that we really need to be instead of all over the place, we would actually be in a better position to have a wider range of options in dealing with Iran and to be less concerned about some of these kind of oscillations in the region. Because we, you know, we didn't choose, for instance, the post-October 7th conflict. And it seems like the Iranians were kind of surprised by exactly what happened as well. And yet, we're at each other's throats right now. And so we don't want to have the oscillations of the region pushing us toward a conflict with them uh, that neither side necessarily set out to seek. And if we're in a more carefully chosen, more modest position in some of the most vulnerable places, I think we actually would have a lot more flexibility and be less exposed to some of these vibrations around the region. Yeah, I mean, war with Iran would be a very, very bad thing. Like it's a, it's a, it's a very large country, a, a more capable country than some of the other, uh, uh, countries in the region that we've been at war with before. Um, I think it would be very, very damaging, uh, uh, to our country. Uh, why do you think there are so many, like, I mean, I feel like I hear on TV every other week, people like Lindsey Graham saying we need to bomb Iran like what why do they not see that this would you know escalate into a much larger conflict that would be damaging to our interests I certainly understand their sentiment I mean it, it we have a lot of history with the Iranians and it's an ongoing history we are constantly doing violence against each other and they've done a lot of stuff to us uh so this is something that is about detangling it. But yes, there is there is very high risk to a conflict with Iran, especially because it's not clear exactly how it would end. It's unlikely that the United States would invade Iran for the reasons you articulated. It's a big country. The terrain is pretty unfavorable. Uh, the core of the country is quite far away from the from the coast. So it would be a really difficult war to fight in a way that's decisive. 
So you would end up fighting it with a lot of airstrikes, which tend to not be decisive as much as it pains me to say that as an Air Force brat. So we would be in this situation where we are fighting them a lot. I think the covert action capabilities they've built would see their side doing a lot of really nasty stuff like blowing up embassies uh, and targeting Americans abroad that would get our uh, get our anger up and have us wanting to do even more without having a lot of good options. And so we would be locked in this cycle with no clear path to the exit. And that's a really bad situation to be in, especially if you say our main priority is East Asia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's very, very interesting. Um, how do you think about the kind of on the other side of the conservative movement, you know, you have, I hate this term, but the new right, um, uh, you know, I think some of it, so there have been some, like we talked about Elbridge Colby a little bit. Um, some people do have a, a, a very, um, proactive, you know, vision for, for how they think about, uh, American foreign policy. Um, but there, there are others that are more, um, just, I don't want to do what those people are, are, you know, saying we should do, like Lindsey Graham saying we should bomb Iran. What do you think a more, um, you know, forward thinking uh, foreign policy for the new right is? And, and, and how does it kind of congeal into one thing? I, I feel like you have two, you have two strains. You have some people that are more, that desire to be more engaged on the global stage. And then a lot of um, libertarians, like we've had Will Ruger on the show, uh, he's going to laugh at me because I called him a libertarian. But um, how, how do we kind of reconcile those things to become a to have a uh, cohesive foreign policy vision uh, in this part of our movement? Yeah, I'm a instinctively a big tent guy. So it's more about smoothing the contradictions and finding areas of agreement than it is about establishing some pure vision. Because, you know, I could tell you exactly what I think U.S. foreign policy should look like. Although even in, in some places I'd say, wow, I, I'm not sure. You know, for instance, I'm not an East Asia specialist. So right. I would point to other East Asia specialists uh, for answers there. But what I would say, I think we just need to reset the baseline of U.S. foreign policy. I think stuff like George Washington's farewell address about uh, avoiding uh, passionate attachments and inveterate antipathies uh, to countries around the world, having a very focused uh, sense of what our national interest is, which I think is the right of Americans to go and uh, engage in commerce around the world in relative security. Uh, the ability of our Navy to sail around the world's oceans uh, and then build off of that foundation to not certainly to not have the kind of global program of ideological transformation that the neoconservatives and neoliberals have tended to favor. I, I think uh, folks on the new right uh, and the right in general tend to be more comfortable with allowing other countries to develop politically and sort out their own problems. And I, I think that makes sense if you're a conservative, that the process of developing political form, of developing constitution in the like Aristotelian sense of a, a broader political order and the culture that exists around it, that takes a long time. That's a process. And that's not something that outside countries are going to be super well equipped to impose in all but the most exceptional circumstances like Germany and Japan after World War II, where there was a lot more foundation to build on. And so trying to transform the values and political cultures of the Middle East is not something that should be at the center of, of U.S. foreign policy. And so that, I think, would be one potential foundation. I think most people would agree Europe should be doing more to take care of Europe rather than looking to America to take care of Europe. The Middle East should not be the center of our foreign policy. Uh, East Asia should be the priority. What exactly that priority looks like is going to vary for a lot of people, but recognizing that there should be a focus there. I think that there can also be agreement if those are your beliefs 
that the Navy and Air Force should be the heart of our military with the Army uh, being a force that is is relatively smaller, uh, does not enjoy the same budgets it does, uh, is is giving resources either back to the taxpayer or to the other branches. Because uh, right now there's kind of a, a tendency to want some of everything and to not anger anybody by taking a, somebody's slice of the pie away. So I, I think you would need to make some of those shifts to create a more Pacific oriented foreign policy. But yeah, in places like Europe and the Middle East, we should be drawing down. And I think most folks are in agreement on that. If you look at the um, <clears throat> several votes that we've had on Ukraine aid over the last couple of years, you see this kind of shift of, you know, you had a lot of conservatives voted for it the first time. And then e each time it kind of goes down the support dwindles. Uh, do you think that this sort of interventionist strain in the conservative movement, um, do you think it's going to continue to go that like it's going to sort of die out and the the uh, realists and the restrainers will rise up on the right? This is purely speculative. I well, understand. I, I certainly but, hope so. Yeah, I certainly hope so. And I think Europe is going to be the place where that's most acute because for people on the right, there's a growing sense of divergence of values with Europe. I mean, you hear about the kind of stuff that's happening in, in the Netherlands. I mean, one of my colleagues just sent an article about their their uh, assisted suicide program where, you know, they've got young people killing themselves uh, with the state's support because they have mental illness. Uh, that's that's like horrifying and weird uh, and disturbing to, I, I think, a lot of Americans, especially on the right. And and there's just a sense that the the Europeans are not uh, uh, are not in line with our values, do not particularly like us uh, in in differences that are narrower than with certain other parts of the world, but that still matter. So the the visceral affection is not there. And uh, there is more capability in Europe to take on responsibility for Europe, whereas in places like the Middle East and East Asia, it's it's much more of a challenge. We're starting from further behind. So I think Europe is really where you're going to see this tendency away from central U.S. involvement in the region's order uh, being realized. Yeah. What a what role do you think the. Uh, domestic political considerations and, and public opinion play now in the way that we make decisions about foreign policy, specifically um, how that's gone with uh, Russia and Ukraine, um, Israel versus Hamas, etc. Yeah, on, on Russia, it's been very interesting because we've seen this polarization where Democrats tend to be more concerned about Russia. Republicans tend to be more concerned about China. And I do think a big part of that stems from from 2016, where Democrats were basically trying to nail uh, Russia to Trump and Republicans were trying to have that not happen. And so you ended up getting this division in how people are thinking about Russia, especially when you remember that in 2012, you know, there was this big controversy because Romney said Russia's our, our number one geopolitical foe uh, in a debate. And that created a lot of a, uh, a stir. I, I would people say like not... laughed at him for that. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, I think in, he, he was wrong that they're number one. But right. We certainly have a bad relationship with them, a very bad relationship with them. And even if we tried to reset it, I don't think it would become a great, friendly, trusting uh, relationship. It would still have a whole lot of problems and a whole lot of frictions. But uh, there has been this weird polarization on the issue. Uh, and so I think it it's going to be very hard for, for instance, the kind of like pro arms control camp among Democrats to deliver uh, new rounds of arms control with Russia because they're suddenly pushing against this kind of like national security aligned uh, national security state aligned branch of the Democratic Party. 
And then on the right, uh, you've, you've seen almost a mirror image of that. And then over on Israel-Palestine, I mean, I, I really don't envy President Biden because if you look at polling among Democrats, they are all over the place. Uh, demographically, younger people tend to be much more sympathetic to the Palestinians, which is it's kind of a first really uh, ever that there's widespread sympathy among any major demographic group for the Palestinians. Uh, typically, the pattern has been people are pro-Israel uh, or they don't care. Uh, the alternative to supporting Israel is not caring or kind of having a pox on both of their houses or, well, I, I see I see two sides of this. And so for there, that is a major shift. And it's clearly behind some of these things that Biden has been doing, like building this pier, talking about delivering aid, et cetera. And he's navigating that. I think politically, he's actually doing a better job at managing his coalition than people give him credit for. Because there is a huge disconnect between online and among younger folks where people are much more sympathetic to the Palestinians, exposed to uh, images of suffering Palestinians, et cetera, and kind of meat space politics where the baseline, especially the baseline Democratic voter, is still pretty sympathetic to the Israelis. And again, like – Young people don't vote as much. So I, I think Biden is probably factoring that in. And even the uh, the famous uncommitted vote in Michigan was fairly small and it was being spun on MSNBC that night as, well, look, they didn't vote for someone else. They just kind of voted blank. So it's it's like loyal opposition. So it doesn't seem like he's shaking in his boots. And the other layer of this is it looks like he's going to lose either way because people mostly aren't voting on foreign policy. It's, you know, it's it's the economy, inflation, et cetera. Yeah, that's it's very interesting insight. Uh, we're going to go now to our members only section. Uh, as a reminder, we have a, a great membership program on YouTube. Uh, you can be either a truther or a statesman. Um, so please do go and take a look at that. Uh, you get access to a lot of really cool extra content. We do bonus episodes. You get uh, the show a day early. You get it on Sunday instead of Monday. Uh, and then we also do these cool bonus sections uh, with every guest at the end of the episode. So uh, make sure to go and check that out on YouTube. You can see our beautiful uh, mugs and we will go now to the bonus section. If you're listening to this, you're almost certainly a highly sophisticated news consumer, but even the most dogged of DC politicos need a news aggregator to help them out. We're big fans of Upward News here at American Moment. Ari David has actually been a previous guest on this show. We highly recommend you check out that episode. But Upward.News is a way that our team keeps in touch with all of the crazy news stories going on around the world. Your Twitter feed is not necessarily 100% reliable to get a proper cross-section of everything going on that matters. Upward News is a fantastic young media startup that is really Really putting together fantastic newsletters and social media content that helps people digest the news, especially if you're tired of being on the phone with your parents and explaining news stories to them multiple times a week because you're the politico in the family. I highly recommend encouraging them to follow upward.news. They do a free five minute daily email that you can sign up for at readupward.com or even better, www.ihatefakenews.com. Uh, it's time for a palate cleanse from politicos, punch bowls, and pucks uh, try upward news today we highly recommend it ari's an incredibly smart patriot and they're a new player on the block focused on cutting through the noise and de de delivering smart analysis please check them out john where can people uh find you and and keep up with all the important work that you're doing uh at the john quincy adams society yeah well so above all i'm on twitter at at john allen gay j-o-h-n-a-l-l-e-n-g-a-y uh, but I would also really recommend signing up for our newsletter. Just go to our website, jqas.org, and sign up for more info, and you'll get our newsletter every week, jobs, internships, articles from around the foreign policy space. Great. Thank you very much uh, for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you again for joining us for another fantastic episode uh, of Moment of Truth. Uh, as a reminder, we, we referenced uh, the John Quincy Adams Society newsletter uh, several times through this podcast. I, I, I mean it seriously. If you're looking to get a 
career and foreign policy in Washington off the ground, that newsletter is the one place I would send you. It's a fantastic newsletter. Go sign up for it. I read it every week and I don't read a lot of newsletters. Um, so I would highly recommend that you that you go and check that out and get engaged uh, with the John Quincy Adams Society. They're a fantastic organization um, focused on on foreign policy. So if this if this is your interest, uh, you've come to the right place. Uh, as a reminder, you can you can find uh, the application for our Fall Fellowship for American Statecraft on our website at AmericanMoment.org slash fellowship. And if you would like to get access uh, to the bonus content that we produce, um, you can go and find American Moment on YouTube and sign up for our membership program. You get uh, bonus episodes. You get the episode uh, a day early. You get access to all the bonus content uh, that we record after the main episode. I would highly recommend that you go and check that out. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment podcast taped at the Conservative Partnership Campus Studios and is produced by Jake Mercier, Jared Cummings, Tiffany Kutris, and Matthew Pearson. Our intro song is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich, and our website is AmericanMoment.org.